You know, when we talk about an urban revolution in Africa, I think the tendency is to think only in terms of demographic revolution, um, or perhaps if you come from a, a, a different sensibility that you would think of a political revolution. Um, and I think that ambiguity in the term of Africa's urban revolution is, is quite important because what it tells us is that there are many things going on simultaneously. Now, now clearly, just the very fact of this profound shift in where people live, um, that the majority of people now grow up in cities, um, and that will be increasingly the case, is the essence of the revolution. Um, but that fact is a catalyst for a whole lot of other revolutions, most importantly an economic one, um, because how people get by has to change. But whatever sector you come from, the cityness changes everything. And it's that notion of changing everything, of rupturing, of transforming, of destabilizing, of forcing us to rethink. So you know, it might be about religion. Um, what is the meaning of religion in the city versus some other more general meaning? Or it might be something like food security, um, because clearly the fact of urban life is, means very different things for what it entails to make a food secure population. So, so I think you can read the urban revolution in multiple ways and you have to read it in multiple ways. The fact that Africa is increasingly an urban continent matters first and foremost to Africans um, because it means that you have to identify and define your your status, your identity, your meaning, your character as an urbanite, as well as an African, which has traditionally not had an urban meaning. So that's a reconfiguration of self, a reconfiguration of collective identity. So it matters for Africans. Um, it matters for Africans because what you do and what is possible as an urbanite is very different from what it is if the city is not your reason for being and your place of action. But I think that the meaning of, of, of an urban continent and of one of the biggest urban continents and the fact that there are more African urbanites than there are anything other than Asian urbanites matters for the world. Um, and it matters profoundly because urban residents are markets in different kinds of ways. Urban residents are political beings in different kinds of ways. Urban residents have a imagination of the future uh, and they do different things. Um, and so the fact that you have such a significant proportion of the world's population living in cities that we have not given adequate cognizance to is really important. Africa's urbanization has been ignored internally, first and foremost. Um, Africans have not embraced their own urban revolution. Um, and I think some of that's because their national leaders have been very reticent to do that. Quite often traditional elites uh, and those in national politics and power um, have positions which are not the same as those who are urban leaders. So there's a, con there's a political conflict which mitigates against embracing urban this as a dominant force, as a positive reality. That's part of it. I think the other part of it is, is that African cities, unlike cities in a lot of other places, often exist on what one might think of as traditional tribal land. So you've got parallel systems of governance, some of which are defined by their non-urbanness, by their pre-modern land tenure, um, and governance arrangements. And so the fact of these kind of conflicting ideas is made for an anti-urbanism. I think some urbanists and urbanists generally have an idea of the city which is informed by Chicago or New York. And so low density, non-industrial spaces, for them don't cut it um, as urban. Um, and I think it's a very prejudicial understanding, a very predetermining understanding of density or form or governance arrangement. So that's, that's a big, big kind of reason. And then there's the fact that Africa is ignored. Um, and if you, you know, so it's not just Africa's urban that's ignored. Um, it's Africa that uh, is not uh, given its, its rightful place in the international imagination.
there's undoubtedly been an anti-urban bias. Um, if you have a look at where donors have spent their money, it's been 90% on rural development and 10% on urban development. And if you have a 50-50 population, that, you know, it's an uncontestable reality that that's a bias. Um, and, and some of that is easy to understand. Um, it's very difficult to turn the ship around. And if you spent a lot of money and you have a lot of internal expertise on agriculture, rural development issues, then it's hard to shift. But some of it, I think, is also, you know, spending money on, on African urban development implies to some extent looking at creating economic competition. So there's a political component to that. And some of it is because academics have pushed a very anti-urban position. And the dominant views have, until probably the last five or 10 years, uh, been explicitly anti-urban. Yes, I do, think that is, I do think that is changing. I think that's changing quite quickly. The difficulty is, and why I think it's so important for us to begin to grapple with the specificity of what we mean by Africa's urban revolution, is that dealing with cities is complex. Um, and it's not easy to say what it is that you should be putting your money and your effort and your intellectual focus uh, on if you are looking at a city. And so it's, and because African cities in some respects are distinctive, it's quite demanding and challenging. Um, so it's very exciting, um, but it's not simple. And so moving beyond an anti-urban bias means putting forward an agenda that's clear, coherent, robust. Um, that takes collective effort. The lack of information on African cities is widely accepted, it's widely condemned, it's widely deplored. Personally, I think that some of the, the real gaps are actually our lack of understanding of Africa's urban history. You know, sort of what, what does it mean to, you know, what's the difference between Ibadan and Lagos? Um, what's the difference between Mombasa and Nairobi? What's the difference? What, what, are, what are the specifics of those things? So the first place that I would, I would define data in its very broad sense to say we don't know enough and we need really detailed, really comprehensive investigations into how cities came into being, how their institutions emerge, why there are gaps where there are, what the contradictions are that exist. That's coupled with a lack of contemporary data of the kind that a lot of applied professionals need, which is, is much more kind of technical. It's about kind of, you know, do we have a map? Do we have street numbers? Um, can we please say what the growth rate is of the city? Um, you know, what, what are the projections that we need for how many houses do we actually need and how many taps do we really require? So, so I think it's both of those things. So it's both data and intelligence. Um, about the cities that we need to engage with. And because there are so many, you know, <laughs> we need to be really careful that we don't generalize. Um, and there's a really real danger that we talk about the African city as if there is one such thing. Um, and until we know more, it's going to be very difficult to know when that generalization is going to cause trouble uh, rather than inform us in particular kinds of ways. So, so the, the dearth of data and information and intelligence absolutely critical to begin to overcome. So we need lots of people to be foot soldiers, um, some of them doing descriptive work, some of them doing reflective, critical, analytical work, uh, if we get to groups with urban policy in Africa. Getting to grips with what's going on in African cities is not just about professional information. Um, I think we need to be careful in thinking that poor people can tell us everything we need to know about themselves. Uh, I think there are limits to self-enumeration. But the idea that people are suggesting that they think that information about themselves is necessary, that they are willing to participate in the collection of that information, and that they provide access to places which are otherwise very difficult to access is incredibly exciting as a, a source of information. Um, and new techniques for collecting and storing and comparing that information make that incredibly valuable. 
Um, so, so for me, where do we get information about African cities is absolutely from the people themselves. But we also need to look at more innovative ways of, of using other kinds of data. Like medical data is a fantastic source of information. If we could spatialize that, we could use it for all sorts of things, so, which we could, you know, um, so that we can map that and we can then begin to corroborate different sc uh, scales of data, different types of data, um, and different forms of data over different periods of time. So that longer longitudinal question uh, is a very important one in that trend data that we, we also need to do. So the combination of, of in-depth snapshot stuff, which we can often get from communities themselves, life histories, surveys, um, and linking that and comparing that with other forms of data, really important. And then going back into the archives um, and, and tracing what we know. Um, and there's information there we haven't plundered. Africa is often seen as a, a, a slum city, if you like. Uh, I have to say it's not a view I, I share. Um, the notion of, of informality is also one that is often used as the defining feature. Um, personally, I think it's, a, it's not only a stereotype, I think it's an unhelpful designation because it refers to too many different conditions. It's not really reflective enough of some of the big changes that are taking place where people consolidate their housing over time. Don't forget that the majority of Africa's urban residents do not have a mortgage. They are building slowly themselves. And so what those cities look like now and what they'll look like in 50 years' time are not the same. Um, but these are not indebted households, at least not on their mortgages. They may be on their clothing allowance and, and other kinds of credit, but not uh, on housing. So I think the, the, the whole idea of the slum, um, particularly as it's tied to kind of physical conditions and tenure conditions, has been something of a misnomer. That and the fact that we've got a, a youth bold, um, I think we may look back on this time period and see things very differently in, in, in decades to come. Having said that, if we actually don't get our act together to ensure that the way that people build housing for themselves and shelter for themselves is done in a way that enables servicing, is done in a way that enables some kind of neighborhood upgrading as well as individual housing upgrading, we are absolutely going to have slums. And if we aren't able to put in place the kinds of enforcement that you require to do things like basic waste removal, we absolutely are going to have slums. And if we don't put in place the public health um, prerequisites, clean water, clean sanitation, uh, then yes, we will have what we would think of as typically as slum conditions. But I, but I think we need to be very careful how we use the term. There's been a very interesting resurrection of the idea that planners actually can do good in Africa. Um, and in African cities. And, and I, for one, welcome that. Um, I think that planning has had justifiable bad press, but I think it's been crude and simplistic in the sense that it's focused only on the negative aspects of an overambitious planning regime that was intended to protect the elite rather than one that was intended to create a public good and to protect the poor. And planning is certainly perfectly capable of doing that, but to do that it has to be embedded in a much wider system of government, government, note I said, not governance, um, which is, operates effectively at the city scale. Um, and to do that, you need to have an effective tax regime. So in other words, you can't just look at planning in isolation. Planners can't solve everything. Planners absolutely have a role to play. Um, and being bold about what that role is and clear about what that role is at a moment that cities are being built is crucial. Uh, and African cities are being built as we speak. But to assume that planners can do everything on their own, for me, is, is deeply problematic. And so I would, I would, for example, say that municipal finance was it's the twin. You can't do the one without the other. Um, and there would be other elements of that. Uh, building regulations. That's a more general aspect of law reform and the rule of law that you want to be looking at. Now, planners don't hold the rule of law. They look at elements of the rule of law. So locating planning in a wider system of governmentality where we look at what is required to run a city with the interests of the poorest person at heart is absolutely what we have to do.
The gap between what theory and, and practice generates in the African context is probably, and the African urban context, is probably less severe than it is in a lot of other contexts. Um, partly because people who work in African universities generally have their feet more than dirty um, in consultancies. Um, for, for me, the bigger problem would be that African intellectuals probably don't spend enough time reflecting, and they also don't spend enough time working on a longer time period of reflection. In other words, they don't know where ideas came from. It's very short term. A lot of the academic work is very short term. So it falls into some of the same problems that one would normally accuse practitioners uh, of. Um, it's not adequately reflective. It's not adequately. Uh, critical, it, it doesn't step back far enough. Um, that's one of the problems. I mean, to be, to be honest, I would argue that the bigger problem is not the gap between theory and practice in the African urban context. The, gap, the problem is the gap in absolute knowledge and the number of people doing enough work. That's a much more serious problem. In other words, if we had 100 times the work that was being done, we would be much better off, even if it was in the same ratio of theory and practice. I think states matter for cities. They matter a lot. Um, the difficulty in the African context is that the state is sort of only half formed, um, and particularly at the local level, our patterns of decolonization meant that local government is really quite embryonic. Um, and there are vast settlements that are being developed without any coherent local government. Um, so, so having an understanding of, of, of states, not just as nation states, is, is absolutely key. The idea that states will do everything is, is clearly unrealistic um, and, and aspirational. Some people would think it's a terrible idea and they wouldn't like the states to do anything anyway. Um, but, but defining the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis other major players seems to me to be the critical thing. Um, and defining the role of the state in essential elements. In other words, what do we need to do quickly and what do we need to do well? Um, is really important. So for me, the, the key thing that states have to be able to do is to define the rule of law and to ensure a fiscal mechanism for taxation collection and some kind of redistribution. Um, beyond that, it needs to be an enabling body which facilitates a whole range of dialogue, um, whether it's around raising capital or creating a predictable environment, because cities really need predictable environments. You, you, you have to know where bulk infrastructure is going. Um, you do need to have some understanding of, of a, a relatively long-term future. And holding that information, I can't see who can do that other than states. And part of the problem in the African urban context is that states don't have that information. That's precisely what they don't have. Um, so, so it's a long-winded way of saying it doesn't matter if you don't like states, you have to have them. Um, and if you don't have them, you have to build them. And then having some clear idea of what you can realistically expect them to be able to achieve, because they won't achieve everything and they can't achieve everything, is probably a helpful way to, to engage the urban question. One of, one of the problems with donors is that they change their minds rather too quickly. Um, and, and so the first thing I would argue is, is that what they need to be able to do is to, to ensure a degree of predictability in what it is that they do. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is it seems to me that donors actually are important as catalysts, not as agents of delivery. Um, and that's, for me, the most important role that they can do. So that puts the focus on knowledge. Um, and they, I think, play an interesting role in that regard. And Africa is a continent that is short on knowledge. Um, so whether it's knowledge from practice or whether it's research in, in a more pure form, it seems to me that's a very crucial role uh, for donors to play. The second thing that donors have a really good handle on is, is they, have an, they, are in a, they have a comparative eye in a way that people in individual places don't have. Um, so they can play a really important catalytic role in that regard. 
um, you know, this is what's going on here, this is what's going on there, can we broker a meeting between X, Y, and Z? That's really useful stuff. So, so I think that's important. Uh, where donors set the agenda is in absolute defiance of what they say they want in terms of democracy, because it means that the citizenry is not accountable, or they, to, the, the state is not accountable to its citizenry. So um, I think there's a much greater awareness of that um, than, than there has been um, in, in the past. With respect to investors, um, look, I mean, I think the real difficulty with investors is that they're an extremely mixed bag, you know. So we, we're talking about big multinationals, we're talking about corporates of very different kinds, whether you're talking about Chinese corporates or European corporates or indigenous corporates, and that all of those exist in, in the African urban context. So, um, I mean, the, clearly, they are much more important than states when it actually comes to building cities. Um, and I think making sure that there is some kind of shared understanding of what a vision of the city should be, what their role and contribution to it might be, would make them more willing to accept a regulatory framework that was apparently controlling but probably beneficial to them in the medium term. So, so again, a slightly longer view of their self-interest might actually be useful. Well, I mean, I think when we look at global environmental change, by which we might mean anything from climate change to major demographic change, to the kinds of changes that are unleashed because of the way that the overall human population consumes, whether that's water or land or wood, um, what we realize is that African cities are as much affected by changes that take place in other parts of the world as they are changes that take place internally. So the demand for resources from Asia, which has had the biggest population growth, has created massive changes in the African urban context, not least because we've got new mining towns. So I think the first thing that we have to think about is, is that the points of pressure or, or the drivers of change may not be African ones, even though they manifest in an African context. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think which is really important is there's been something of a, of a misconception I think on global, on within particularly the climate change environment which has seen the impacts of climate change have been traced particularly to deforestation um, and to some extent um, around agriculture and agri um, because of, of, of the variability in rainfall have been linked to droughts and therefore the impact on food production. Actually, I think the most important impact of global environmental change will be in urban contexts, because that's where people are utterly dependent on an external service provider for water. If the water's not dammed, you, and there's variability, what are you going to do? Uh, and similarly for food, um, where you are not producing your own food, you are utterly dependent on, on food supply and on levels of affordability for food. So if the costs of food go up and urban populations can't afford that, and I don't think that the global environmental change community has been adequately alert to the urban implications uh, of change. And so beginning to tease those out, you know, whether that's about air pollution um, because of temperature changes or whether it's because of, 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 of the, the urban impacts of drought um, or of migration. Um, there, there's absolutely no question. And when you start talking about some of the very large cities that we're now getting in Africa, we've got tens of millions of people living in one place. The disease profiles that are likely to shift because of climate change and increasing temperatures are profound. And those impacts are not simply going to be felt in the tropical cities of Africa. These cities are now much better connected into a global system of cities. Um, and so tracking those and having an understanding of what's going on in those cities is absolutely critical um, in a global environmental change framing uh, of what's going on in the world. I think one of the things we've got to be very careful of is that what we, we want to avoid is a situation where we have all the, the big international corporates saying African cities are wonderful and we have all the academics saying, oh no, no, you've missed the boat and actually it's terrible because what we've got is rising poverty. Because um, actually, of course, both are true. Um, what we actually have is an extraordinary rise of a middle class, of a very rich middle class, 
but we also have extreme poverty. And the difficulty is actually what's going on in the middle, um, and that we know very little about. What is clear is that some of the increases in, in, in wealth, which are undoubtedly there, are of such a low base that it's very easy to overestimate them. But we know so little because we've stereotyped ideas of the informal sector, for example. We don't understand Africa's urban labor markets very well. Um, and so everybody who's hazarding those guesses is making guesses. Um, and the real research on which one would expect to be making the sort of detailed assessments about where we should all be putting our pension fund money, because that's ultimately what we're talking about. Where are we investing and who stands to gain and what kind of profit? Um, those kinds of, of ideas are, are, in my view, simply not well enough researched. So, but what, what is clear and where I think the corporates are right is what they have grasped, which I think the academic community has missed, is that the numbers that we are talking about are sufficiently large that it has to be important whatever happens. So a billion people living in Africa, the majority of whom are urban and becoming more so, is really important. Um, and that they've got right. I think Africa's urban future is fortuitously urban. Um, and, I, and I say that because we know that there are limits to rural production. Agriculture cannot sustain the continent's population and the continent's continued population growth. So that's it's opportune in the sense then that actually there are other opportunities. But I think it's also opportune in the sense that I think cities actually have the capacity to generate the kind of wealth and more importantly the kind of innovation that is required to come to terms with the continent's challenges, which are significant. And they are educational, they are health, they are infrastructure, they are a whole range of those things. And I, it seems to me that only cities and only urban solutions actually offer a viable way forward. And then it's opportune for me because I think actually in the way that Africa has been ignored historically is probably not possible once you have an articulate urban intellectual force which is able to position the continent and its needs and its politics globally uh, in ways that haven't been done before. So I think in the, all of those senses the, the, there's a there's a lightness and, a, and a, an optimism associated with the urban future, uh, with which I, I ascribe to that. So 